what I thought we'd do first of all, Dirk, is um, just uh, talk a little bit about um, the <coughs> different periods that are represented yeah. in the exhibition. Um, and one of the key terms that you always come back to um, is this notion of abstraction mm. in what you call experimental film. Now, <coughs> you've also noticed that there, there's, a, there's a development. And so if we go back, say, to 223, which is mm. nearly 40 years ago that yeah, you made 80, that. 85. 85. And then we look at the, <coughs> uh, the Rope movie, which is nearly a decade later. Um, I can see there's a, there's a, if we're talking about abstraction, I can see there's a change yeah. there. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that meant to you in relation to the 223 yeah. um, composition and <coughs> how you understood abstraction um, in the following decade. Yeah, well, 223 came in a bit after I'd done quite a few chant films, you know, inspired by music by Steve Reich, that kind of repetitive kind of stuff, that kind of stuttering, sort of trance-like stuff. And the 223 was uh, becoming a bit more personal because I was looking back into my childhood and finding images from that that I was then covering over with all this stuff that I didn't really understand why. And it was trying, and it was, they were shorter pieces, they were also a reaction to the fact that it was very hard to get funding and I was coming and trying to come up with innovative ways to actually keep on working the way I wanted to, you know. So I worked there by just scratching stuff like yourself. It kind of helped. Then I went... Uh, wrote movie was made in uh, Canada. How long were you in Canada? A couple of years, three yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. And that really came out of too. That there was a different sort of community there because people would. There was much more dialogue, and there was much more kind of uh, challenging people about their work before it was finished. And there was so that I really uh, helped me, and I got more into the sound and more into a kind of narrative kind of structure for the work mm. uh, because because of that. Mm. Well, it's interesting in the, if we just move forward yet another decade yeah. to Empire, um, there yeah. is a very clear narrative. Um, similar techniques of, <clears throat> of fast cutting from one um, sort of film moment to the next, but still a much stronger narrative. In fact, a very clear thematic narrative. Yeah. Um, was that one reason for <clears throat> selecting this for the exhibition to sort of yeah. highlight this sort of change of relationship to narrative? Yes, and that was also after I come back to Australia, and it was also you know finding images, stereoscopic images that were made in the nineteen twenties that I then retooled mm. for kind of watching uh, with a single eye, you know. So using the kind of flicker and rhythms that I had been using earlier, and keeping that as a a, a kind of uh, know, more of a photographic kind of trace. And the thing that, I mean, a lot of this work, I'm testing things out, you know, yes. like in that one, the one that I liked that I thought I got out of it, oh, I'm getting very cubist-like images out of this. And that's because I'm quickly shifting from one eye position to another, which was very big in the 20s mm. when, when that sort of work was being done. So I kind of learn about all these art kind of things through that. I mean, the pop thing maybe in terms of some of those drawings on 223, for example, mm. you know. I mean, one of the interesting things about um, Empire, to some extent, wrote movie, is the materials refer to histories in which you were not directly present, um, but are felt to shadow, shape, or in some way haunt um, your own life experience. Mm. Is that true? Yeah, but I, not directly present. I think this idea of displacement and dissociation out in the landscape has been part of my relationship with this country all along. Mm. And I think I revisited it, you know, by making Empire after migrating or going to another country apart from Australia, and then coming back, I, I start to really look at that. Mm. Uh, but I think I lost the thread of your question. No, I, I think that, that was really where I was moving. Yeah. So what happens is that, as you say, as a migrant, you find yourself inserted. Um, it's a bit like editing an old film. You find yourself inserted into somebody else's film. Mm -hmm. And the imagery that um, you operate with, the language, the imagery and the language, are not your own. 
So <coughs> to some degree, you're interpolated by, mm. if you like, the 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 screen and the stream of consciousness into which you find yourself moving. Mm. And what I thought was interesting there was when I looked at particularly um, the earlier films, two, two, three, for example, was that sense that uh, behind the image there was also uh, another image. So mm. this was something that, of course, is very connected to the history of cinema itself. So there's a wonderful passage in uh, Musil's uh, um, great novel where he talks about this sensation as he watches an early flickering film of another film happening behind it the whole time, which he cannot quite access. And he likens it a little bit, obviously, to the Freudian unconscious. But the point is, it's something that is writing the structuring of experience, mm. but you can't access it. The sense in which you are yourself um, a product of a prior displacement. And I thought that very strongly with Empire, because what mm. you're seeing there, in fact, is uh, people who are displaced. Mm. And then you are displacing the image of their displacement. Well, this thing about something underneath it all, I think, in a way, discovering things that had happened to me, past traumas and stuff, I think, in a way, I started working in this area of film as a tool to try and regain some sort of bodily access to some of these things. Yes. You know, and they weren't a narrative, and they were there, and they fit into to me in terms of, you know, what is embedded in the body, mm. you know, and what was... For me, when I came here as an eight-year-old, there were things that were in my body that I were kind of erased, and then I had to rediscover them. And then the whole thing about Australia too, you know, it was like I was uh, I was thinking about my filmmaking in terms of there was no narrative there that that was what a good Austra new Australian was. They erased their own narrative to become something else. Exactly. And then I yeah. I learned. I had to confront at some point the fact that that wasn't working for me. Yeah, yeah. You know? Tell me, with the most recent of the shorts in this exhibition, the title is interesting, Death of a Place. Right. Because what's shown in the film is not the death of a place, it's the death of a car. Um, or it's the, it's the repeated yeah. uh, trauma of the crash. Um, how did you arrive at that title? Well, I made that title in, in here, in this space. And it sort of came at the end of a lot of the things when my marriage broke down and that I came to the conclusion that place had died for me. Mm. The fight, even though, in a sense, it never really attained it anyway here. That it was you mean as a possibility of belonging or as a possibility of arrival had, had died? Well, that the place that I arrived at had died, yeah. that I'd kind of accommodated. Yeah. And so... I started to get fragments of things that are lying around this studio and putting them together as a kind of fragmentary trace of this sort of gesture of, ma of telling a story that hadn't quite worked. And I mischievously put a bit of McLuhan and a bit of Flusser in there because while I became more engrossed in academia, which was a great challenge for me, you know, he, his idea that uh, the, mig the freedom of the migrant, that the... That the the migrant has embellished or scars put mm. straight onto the body mm. and experiences displacement and movement in a much more visceral and uh, personal way that they might, we might, they might not straight understand, but I kind of like that idea, especially in a time when we've got so much information and so much moving around that we don't. But for other people, it, it, you don't necessarily... Uh, you just do it in your bedroom. You go from one place to another in your bedroom. But, I mean, having actually experienced that migration in some physical form, mm. I think that becomes a great a great asset in these days. Well, yeah. one interesting thing about just talking about those four right. films in the show, they cover, obviously, a very long period, almost 40 years of practice. Yeah. Um, they have clear generic similarities. I mean, the... the the compositional techniques are quite comparable, even yeah. though the content and the way that the, the contents created are quite different. And this brings me to another question I had. <clears throat> this to do with duration. Um, each one of those films is um, sculpting yeah. duration. On the other hand, over the nearly 40 years of the practice, the enduring nature of a particular 
uh, approach. We can call it um, to the, the tremulous nature of the image, the saturated image, the image which, as you say in your catalogue note, can be understood as a visual metaphor of trauma. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the experience of a surplus of um, influx of information, whether it's through uh, a physical rupture <clears throat> or whether it's through a mental or psychological rupture, uh, becomes a, a hallmark of the mm -hmm. films you're making. But it'd be interesting to get your thoughts about the therapeutic nature of duration in these films. In other words, they're either mm -hmm. they're either turning over at a speed that's slightly too fast for us to take in any kind of s static image. At the same time, they create a very strong sense of impending composition. Something is something is happening yeah. because, um, shall we say, the image has been speeded up, it's been animated. Um, I wonder if you've talked to that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, that's about my relationship with an audience, I think. I mean, even very early on with some of those things, they were considered very aggressive and it was almost like avoiding people, you know, or attacking people in a way unknown to me. There was an anger coming out and that's kind of matured. But I think duration, there was a duration of making the work. It would take a long time. I'd be in the studio or somewhere and I'd work on it. And that was my space, my yeah. safe place. And so it was, whereas, and I, thinking about uh, the, uh, the looking for Burrow work, it's almost like now I'm actually moving that safe place Mm. more clearly in terms of the landscape and in terms of duration in a place where the audience can also embrace that part of my uh, thinking. Sure. Well, we'll, think? com we'll, 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 come to, we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah. <clears throat> Staying with these, the, these earlier films, or in fact not earlier in the case of Death of a Place, but the, very, the particular techniques that are being used, mm -hmm. the connection between duration and enduring. So... Um, mm. I like very much this, the, the, the idea of your aggression towards the audience. So the audience is being pulled through a comparably disturbing experience, but also one, I have to say, uh, filled with this magical and beautiful imagery. So it, there is a kind of rapture as well mm. as an attack. And it's quite erotic in that sense. Some of the colour that you've managed to achieve in the, in the um, remastered versions mm. is extraordinary on the small screen. So there is both voluptuousness mm. as well as, a, um, as you say, a sort of turning away from a direct uh, engagement with, shall we say, narrative. So the duration seems to me has something positive about it in the mm. sense there, isn't a, there is a capacity through the film to endure the pain. Is that true? Yeah, I like that idea. I think when you say that, I think of my mother. Mm. <clears throat> I think because of her endurance, the, yeah, and her a bit, her need to just keep going, yes, and actually giving me that gift uh, because we went through a lot of issues, and there's a documentary about that too, yes. And so I think that that was her her, her position as a migrant that she endured that mm. with a very Dutch kind of I don't know what you'd call it, uh, oh, stoicism perhaps, I yeah. Don't know. I think the other thing. Th th there's that in there. I mean, I, it was something that I didn't like in a lot of ways, but I think that endurance thing, you know, and I'd also, you know, you go through cycles of feeling positive and negative about your work, and there was always a way of coming back, that endurance, that there was a, a thing about that helped you turn back and well, keep yeah. working. And you talked about your mother's pattern making, her craft. And, that's right. And I think that's important, obviously, uh, in terms of the... Um, the way this work communicates as yeah. an aesthetic object is precisely through the power of the composition and the way that the, the speed, um, the very important uh, word texts, which um, you mm -hmm. know, extraordinarily uh, integrated into, or actually visualised yeah. um, in terms of there being... You know what I think, a, we, something, something when you said before that it came that from, I think that came mm -hmm. to me partly because as coming into the third or second grade in Australia, the chalkboard had all these repetitions and all these words and stuff on it. Mm. And I think that was my first introduction to English. Mm. And it's about a recomposition of those kind of moments and trying yep. to 
that, that, that come through that for me. That's right. So what, what's very strong in, in, the, in the short film we're talking about is that sense that there is another order behind yeah. what you can see. We could call it some kind of old grammar or native tongue that is unobtainable. Yeah. It, it was never quite there. So all we have now is these substitute parts, which we'll try and put together like a jigsaw to make some sort of sense. But yeah. always behind it is that, as you say, that we'll call it a migrant trauma, the sense of not ironically having a mother yeah. tongue. So you have to find your mother. And yeah. this engagement with your mother seems to be an important part of your own mm. craft. And there seems to be this repetition about it too. Just don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. In some of my earlier films, which are sort of regular about suburbia, you know, I'd have these chants that would repeat like in experiments. I I just pull my eyes out and breathe. It's sort of this kind of, and I just r repeat these things, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was part of my process of trying to, come up with a tongue that sort of fitted in and that was also a time when sort of minimalism and repetition was seen to be happening internationally mm. and I kind of that sort of you know I, f I felt interested in that I mean those earlier films too there was a, a movement about visual music where there was a lot of abstraction that was repeated and the structures which are more musical than the narrative they were in a lot of those early films and I f felt a familiarity with that yeah. You know. Okay, I have a couple of interrelated questions. One about abstraction and one about community. And I think they might be connected. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned before um, the word that you used to describe um, your, your earlier films as being involved with some concept of abstraction. Then um, you mentioned briefly your period in Canada where there yeah. was a different sense of community. Now, I'm imagining from the film that your, your film content and composition didn't change enormously but what did change was the community looking in on what mm. you were doing so I'm wondering whether abstraction is the right term and mm. whether it's it's um, a reflection of solitude or isolation whereas because the films do not strike me in any way as abstract they strike me as incredibly intimate uh, physical and sensuous um, <clears throat> and there's reaching out for uh, connection and so I'm interested to hear what you've your experience has been of, of community Mm. or peer group response, um, not a, a comprehensive response, not possible, but there are key moments, obviously, which um, you are looking at now in terms mm. of the Super 8 period and so on. I wonder whether you could talk a little bit. Is abstraction a function of not having community? Well, in terms of the practice, <laughs> but I was also having trained as a social worker involved with community development. There was a time where I politically tried to, you know, develop a sort of a more of a film art community or build on it in, in Australia and a lot of that didn't work out and part of that work of reclaiming some of it is part of that and I think going to Canada was very important there because it could see that internationally there are places where these things had sort of developed further you know they can go into reasons for that but it certainly helped with me because uh, I think I was a lot more inarticulate before I went to Canada. Mm. You know, I learned to talk more about those things and I learned to look into the ideas of trauma and how it worked. Not necessarily just as a trauma. It's about learning a new language, a trauma about learning, dealing with a new technology and stuff like that. That's what those things became about for me. And that was like, uh, and that was the, what, you know, I've used the word abstraction, but I sort of shifted more into this idea of, of trauma, I think, as mm. a, and like I just tried to say before too, again, is that trauma, you know, can be kind of trauma, physical and pain and everything. But it's also, you know, the world is changing technologically all the time, and that forces lots of changes on those senses on it. And I, I was trying to really deal with that and trying to understand that by working with these kind of abstractions, which were kind of liminally sitting somewhere where meaning was born or where I would start to make sense of things. Because mm. I was never interested in abstraction as going into abstraction. It was more always coming out of it. So abstraction is sort of almost on the, in the edges where something is transforming into something else. And it could be a technological moment. Obviously, it can be like a dream moment too. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's also interesting, which is not so much represented in the present show, is uh, your time-lapse work. We'll, mm. we'll come to um, the Birrung work in a moment. Yeah. But... Um, that has, as it were, on the face of it, the opposite um, 
mm. compositional process. So rather than being a very rapid dynamic collage of found pieces, it's a remarkably continuous uh, focus on a relatively uneventful mm. frame or scene. And this can endure, uh, or it has a duration that could be years, mm. certainly Decades. a number of months. Yeah. So there you have the opposite, but then your, your process with that is then to speed it up. And so in that case, it's almost the, the menace or the sense of um, a unnatural bunching of tiny, tiny overlooked events produces the trauma. So it would seem to me there you're taking control of the medium, which, as we've said before, filmic, mm. you know, pre-digital pre filmic uh, technology had that stutter in it. It was always there as what frame to frame. There was always the, the, the possibility of the thing stopping uh, and always behind it in the early days. Mm. There was the hover and shiver and of the shadow, but in digital technology, clearly that's gone. So what you have now is... Um, a, a new way of constructing, as, as it were, the traumatic image. Mm. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I think there's a trace of that, that hyper vigilant kind of stuff that speed up there. But I, you know, you mentioned before there's something behind. I think it was about revealing something that was behind all that because what I was hope why what I wanted to happen in terms of getting with some of the time lapse, seeing the kind of rhythms and the kind of strokes, it might have been just the shadows moving or anything, that are somehow invisible. And I like that idea mm. that they're somehow invisible in daily life, but they're there and I can uncover them. Mm. And that seemed to be part of that same thing, that I wanted to uncover something that I didn't understand in that earlier abs uh, abstract word. I should use another word but for abstract, shouldn't mm. I? Yeah, it's, it's well, fine. It's fine. Yeah, so that, that, that's... Well, that that's, is. that's a very interesting remark too about the shadows because, yeah. um, um, and it relates to the, the, um, <clears throat> the personal experience behind death of a place mm. because a place may have failed mm. but what's very interesting with the time lapse uh, work you've done is the place is rediscovered mm. and it's rediscovered as, a, as a, a, an endless anonymous sequence of cycles which never quite repeat themselves so it's not uh, the only place is actually the the the, the lens of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, the the observed is a field of self reforming pattern making. So again, similar to your mother's handiwork, and this mm -hmm. it just it will just go on enduring, and yet it's comforting. Mm -hmm. In it, it, it's it's extremely to me anyway affecting to find that the anonymous environment uh, is going about its own business in a mm. way that um, is not concerned with our affairs. <clears throat> and that, that, that's the, that was triggered in a way by COVID, <clears throat> you know, because there was a level of immobility that happened that I wanted to somehow get away from and being close enough to that space here on the bay here, I could go there, you know, mm. and... I mentioned before that whole idea about sitting in the studio and working on something for hours and hours, and that was like sort of comforting, you mm. know. But it, there, I'm, even though, you know, there's, there's 10 to 12 second stanzas, I'm sitting there for an hour and I'm thinking and I'm looking at the horizon and there's something that's happening to me that this becomes a, a, a kind of memento of, you mm. know. And it's just, I like the idea that it's built up and then that really I've done years of this. Hmm. I'm just looking, looking. And what, by looking at, I'm, I started looking at the horizon because I, I, I was told or read somewhere that, you know, you, if you put your eyes resting on the horizon, that's the most relaxing place for it to be. <clears throat> and so sort of content came back in through that. Well, let's, let's, because you've, you've now moved on to okay. this. this. Um, this latest piece, it's called Looking for Birum. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll come to that in a moment. One of the things that um, you also um, have talked to me about is your meditation at the same time on the legacy of the artist uh, Clarice Beckett. Yeah, Clarice yeah. Beckett. Now, I don't know a great deal about her work, but I would like to 
share with you three things I can think of in relation to her. Yeah. Um, and the reason for doing this, I want to just press you on the parallels that I can see between her story and what you seem to be achieving in this film. And the reason for doing this is I want to actually separate out a little bit this discussion at this point from um, the, the name Birol, which I think mm. is something we can talk about later. So <clears throat> a couple of things that um, we know about Clarice, uh, apart from the fact that she died very young, she was only 48, mm. she looked after her parents down here in Beaumaris, mm. and because of her daily routine and caring for her parents, she was only able to paint at dusk and dawn. So this is a very important thing. So she's she's involved directly with horizon moments. Mm. In other words, the setting of the sun or that gradual sort of uh, emergence of mm. clarity out of mist at the beginning of the day. Um, the criticism of her work, or of course the revelation of it, which is this um, reliance on the composition of tonalities so a lot of the criticism mm. of her early of her work from male critics was that it doesn't yield a clear image. Um, the tonalities have their own compositional purpose, and it's it's all across that surface that you start to become aware of a drama. Mm. But most of the drama is secreted inside the imagination of the viewer. Something might be happening. Mm. It's emergent, um, and seems to me that that's very much associated with a painting practice that will be attuned to the daily cycles, seasonal cycles of the weather. Mm. And the last thing that, this is quite left field, but um, personally I find it sort of intriguing, is that very few of her paintings survive. And so the large, largest part of her paintings um, were left in the shed. Yeah, they withered away. And they withered away. So, to make a provocative question, in what sense is mm. the, the film you've made, The Lost Paintings? Well, there's something lost. I've lost things in the past, and it's a way of grabbing that. Uh, I think maybe I've been looking in through all this losing as a productive way of forgetting somehow. And, I mean, I came across Clarice because so you see all these images around that they've put, the council's put around. Mm. But after a while, I, I, there was an exhibition there and stuff. But I started to become aware of her tones that I would experience them directly from the landscape. Mm. You know, I might not have been able to translate that very well in my own work. I mean, I'm not saying that I reproduced it, but I certainly felt it. And I felt it as very real, you mm. know, and that's... That was very uh, useful to um, make me feel grounded. That's right. You know. Yeah. So this is very interesting. So the the like we were talking about before the the image, should we say, the, the image that you create is imagined as an invitation to somebody else to recognise themselves there, but what mm. they're recognising is something that's been lost, uh, mm. and that would seem to be a. Um, a recurrent theme in the work that I want, I'm, the invitation is not to embrace a positive image, no. but it's to see in the other of the image something you've lost. And I was thinking too, you know, that I want, you know, I had this fantasy about looking back into the past that it was sort of a time machine doing this, and I was hoping to be able to look further back. Mm. But you know, and then there's also in terms of that lostness, the yearning of watching those boats that commodified kind of network sort of coming across the horizon you know because the first time I came in Australia came on a boat that went to Princess Pier or whatever it was but the first landscape I saw was where I was now filming this from mm. so mm. there's this the, I didn't think about those things but when I think about what am I getting actually getting out of this somehow it is tying some things together for me mm. there's mm. A, like things that in the past, have felt lost. There's somehow. Well, I uh, think it's, it's interesting. Yes, I understand that. It's interesting you talk about the horizon. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because the horizon, presumably, is a very important part of that 
uh, visual language. It's also, of course, as you say, with a very strong psychological moment. So the, the horizon is a before and after, it's above and below. Yeah. Um, it is the, the, the cut that connects. So at that very moment across that cutting edge, you see change, you see mm. what could be traumatic arrival, but at the same time you also see it, it it's always there well, as, the, as the ever-present past. That's right, but at the fog, sometimes the fog is such that you say you can't even see the horizon line <laughs> with the, the way the light works, yeah. you know, and it reveals itself and loses itself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I kind of like, well, like's not the right word, but the idea of fog that fits yeah. into a whole lot of metaphorical things about what am I, tr you know, I'm just so foggy about what I'm doing. I'm talking about decades ago. So it sort of is almost like an artifact of all that as well. And, you know, when I was young, my grandfather would go up and down the Rhine on a boat. So I had this sort of nostalgic sort of connection yeah. back to that. Yeah. And one of my first jobs as a teenager was working with the Melbourne Harbour Trust for a while. And we'd go out and dump mud in the middle on mud island mm. so i it was a place where i'd spend a bit of time on that on that lake so it's a curious curious thing we've been talking now for a while about yeah. the birrung piece but <clears throat> i think if someone was listening to us they wouldn't have any idea that in fact the components of the time lapse have all been speeded up and they've been cut together uh, in other words we're not looking at a, a kind of reflective uh, sort of Clarice Beckett-like um, sort of almost sort of Parisian nostalgia scene here. We're, we're right. looking at something which has a very different feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, each passage of whether it's the clouds or the light on the water or as you say a tanker arriving um, is uh, shown to us a great, greatly speeded up. Um, but those gestures aren't always like hyper, though, are they? There's often, a, isn't there often a, sort of something more calming too about the, the gestures of change of light that come through? I agree, through that? and, and the, so there are two things happening there. One is the uh, the the visualization of pattern. Mm. Um, so clouds at a normal speed don't present an obvious pattern, but when they're speeded up as they are in your film, and as you know, as a mm. common film practice, they immediately start to present this chaotic, turbulent sort of self reforming practice. Mm. Similarly with the clouds moving across the, the, uh, the, the light, um, producing light on the water, similarly with the yachts gathering and mm. deforming and so forth. So you produce pattern by speeding it up. So in that sense it's, it's, it's and then you've, you've, you've decided to juxtapose not violent contrast but actually continuity. So oh, just a slight movement here, it's like mm. very subtle, very, minimalist variations on a theme which is, again, very unlike, say, a montage technique. It's, it's saying, no, no, uh, we are changing now. I'm, I've, that's enough of that. But we're not making a violent contrast. No. So there's a mixture of consolation, but also something that's quite disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, good. Um, it seemed to me that you've got, um, there's a very sort of, uh, there's a term that um, is used in, in biology, um, and it has to do with the, the birth of new forms, sort of morphogenesis, mm -hmm. and it's contrasted with its op opposite, which is things staying more or less in their same shape, morphostasis. And it seems to me that what we're constantly seeing in what seems to be a static or largely continuous environment is episodes of morphogenesis. In other words, constantly you're saying to us, no, it looks like it's broadly speaking, um, continuous consoling mm. but hey when you break it up into these episodes it's continually driving towards change I mean, is that true i think i'm always looking for change it's w um, one of the things that you get from that film is i feel at least um i don't know if, whether it was in part of your your purpose but it feels like there's an impending ending um, and it's there in the cut. So mm. something starts to drive forward and then you cut. And it's very leisurely. I mean, it's not like this. We're not being, we're not having an assault on the eye as we are in the earlier films. But nevertheless, there is continually something happening. It's beginning to happen. And then it's like a sort of um, extinction event. Um, well, you know, I'm, 
I don't sort of wish to die, but I'm increasingly more thinking about, you know, what, how will it all end? And maybe there's a trace of that in there that I've kind of moved away from much more sort of openness to, to try and looking at the other side or the ending of my looking. And how yeah, I think that, end. I mean, that's interesting that you, you interpret my, my comment as uh, about your own mortality yeah. what comes across i think in for me in the film is not your mortality um the observer seems fairly scientific um what comes mm. across is the mortality of the globe um it's the feeling that there is an extinction event happening or it's on the horizon oh, that's um, very nice. and Man. continually you have this sense that what is looking back um um that is to say the content of looking back uh, which is the tonalities of uh, an artist who's yeah. no longer here, but clearly is with us very strongly in the film, is also a prophecy. I, mean, I have this feeling that something is being told. This was not clear in the past. Mm. This was not even clear in the present of the, uh, the, the material, but it's now in the future of this material that there will be an ending. Well, that's... Uh it, very interesting. I mean, I'm, I think what I have achieved over my ritualistic kind of continual looking is becoming a kind of instrument. And even though I've got a lack of enga emotional engagement on one level when I, because I technically do these things, you know, I think I've learned over time to let more of the emotional things that I'm actually looking at speak for themselves a bit more. See, and uh, yeah, I think... Because I, I don't pay that much attention to the, the the global warming and stuff on a on a you know on a intellectual level, I kind of much more impacted by the space itself and letting it t talk to me. I, mm. That's what I'd like. Mm. Maybe uh, sometimes I do a little bit. You know? Well, in in that context, then talking about different scales. Yeah. of obsolescence, renewal, whether it's mm. environmental, technological, clearly one's own life cycles. Um, there is um, quite a, uh, an interesting uh, allusion here to pre-colonisation Port Phillip Bay, Naram is the word you use for it, which is a, um, a uh, probably a Banyurong word. Yeah. Um, now, in looking for Birarung, which as I understand is the same word as should be the word for the Yarra River. That's what I understand in, in my, you know, unwieldy translation of what, sure. what it means. So leaving leaving aside that that aspect of it, the the implication there is about um, seeing this environment um, not from the perspective of the tanker, not from the perspective of the migrant or even the colonist. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, I did a, try and do a bit of reading and a bit of research about, you know, indigenous stories about that space and how at one point, you know, there was a landscape with the Yarra running through it and where it finished, which is contentious, I suppose, it was near Rosebud, but that there was a lot of fog at the end of, at the mouth of that river. And I started to visualise, well, the fog's still here. But it's very different to what it was. Mm. But after a while, I started to just more try and engage with the mm. water and the fluidity of, of what that water was doing or what I could sort of capture of that or what traces I could kind of witness. Uh, and that just sort of developed over time because I'm just technically working with this. Uh, but I like the idea sort of, that looking at that landscape and seeing, am I, can, can I see things here that were seen thousands of years ago? Is there still a, a, a valley, you know, a trace of that? And that, in a way, extends some of the things that I've been reading about filmmakers like James Benning, who kind of look into the landscape to the point where the whole idea of uh, Hollywood now disintegrates and you have to look in another way, you know. And I, I'd like to try and think this is an extreme gesture in that way that I've looked for so long that you can't look in terms of that Hollywood kind of narrative at it anymore, you know. How, how does that 
intuition uh, translate into the way that you've composed the film? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's one thing to talk about um, a deep looking, um, but it's another to compose a film of accelerated fragments. Well, you know, the accelerated fragments were there and, um, you know, through suburbia and all that, and it's there. And as time went on, I'd recede more from the water and some of those suburban traces would kind of become part of the shot. Uh, but basically, I just got into this ritual of collecting an archive over time and then I'd re put it together and then I'd put it together again and sometimes I'd put things that I'd shot a couple of years ago earlier on and it became almost random the way that I put those things together you know in a funny way I kind of think sort of chemically about those sort of things how sort of strings of uh, DNA or whatever are formed as a kind of metaphor for what I'm kind of doing there on this sort of gestural level you know when I'm in front of a computer working with it it's sort of uh, and I've been doing it for so long it becomes I hope that it says something about my body well I think yeah. it does but I also think it's the patterning that you're talking yeah. about the DNA patterning is I think why the the film is so affecting is that the DNA is clearly in the environment um, so in a sense yeah. what 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 we're being invited to do um, is to reflect on our own perception so that's the somatic part, that's the bodily part, that's where we see through the artist's eyes. <clears throat> it's not so much the content out there, um, the deep time potentially, deep time content, but that was up to the viewer it seems to me. Mm. And the thing that, I mean, if we were going to talk in terms of an intuition of past, the most important thing it appears to me is, the, is that impending sense of an ending. Mm. Um, I mean, there's a, there are famous descriptions of um, the it, the indifference of um, indigenous people to the appearance of ships on the horizon. Um, this, uh, this is well documented both in uh, Sydney and also down at Sullivan's Cove in 1803. Um, the Aboriginal people there did not appear to have any curiosity about these strangers on the horizon. Well, you can say they were not looking mm. to that ending. Um, they were looking somewhere else. Um, well, but they're looking more at their, towards their feet, looking more down. Maybe. They were looking inland, in the case yeah. of the first description from Sir Joseph Banks in 1770. They didn't. So the, the um, interesting thing to me about this strand of, yeah. of, of seeing in the film is it's about constantly counterposing continuity and ending continuity and, and that's why i talk about morphogenesis things are continually forming and that present that creates a sense of foreboding a slight sense okay something is happening very quickly here even though it's so slow uh, and again as with the early films something might pass us by we didn't notice it and it could be like a, it could be a very jagged uh, hurtful experience that's going to happen or it could be something that will just fade away but the contingency that's created, the drama that's created, even in those calm, is never depressive. It's always highly um, <clears throat> dynamic, mm. uh, combative, agitated, and um, engaged. I remember sitting there one day filming when the, that earthquake sort of went through. I thought it was a truck passing <laughs> by. But uh, that was like the, the landscape physically saying something. Mm. But I also felt that over time, I wasn't. I started to looking more at my feet too. Mm. And I started looking at more at the the kind of patterning and, and stuff of the shells and the ripples of the, sa uh, the the traces that are left on the sand. And so, temporal patternings. Yeah, I don't. I feel good about assembling that because it's an attempt to sort of put. You know, a couple of years of my life together in one moment, mm. in a way that's not just about remember what or looking at a photo album. You know. Mm. Um, so, just to finish, maybe on that note, which yeah. is we look back across this body of work as is available now um, at Bayside. 
the autobiographical um, theme comes up right. in um, your reflection on each of those films. But at the same time, we've been talking about... That, that, that one just died. This one's still going. We were talking about, um, in a sense, the, the urgency of this total project being the absence of a conventional autobiography one based on you know fixed place <coughs> fixed respectable parentage uh continuity so the the migrant trauma <coughs> exacerbated in your case by other mm -hmm. experiences is one of massive and continuous displacement um so it seems to me that when we talk about as you repeatedly do about the autobiographical content or motivation of these films there is a sense in which uh, we can turn it inside out and say, well, no, where is the autobiography unless it's in the film? Um, it's a bit difficult to separate you out as an artist mm. from um, the endurance of suffering made good through the film. Is there something of that in there as well? <laughs> I think it's an uncanny sort of a thing that I've been trying to look at the things underneath and trying to find them. And here I've produced something where that remains a, a dilemma for the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a sense, I've re reproduced that that problem or that I saw, something that I saw as a problem when I was young. But, you it might, but to, 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 to press you a little bit further, why would that be a, why would that not be a triumph rather than a problem? I'm getting to the point where I can think of it more as a triumph. Yeah. And I mean, I feel that with this exhibition, I am kind of feeling a sense of, okay, I can move on in some way. And that's not, I mean, that, okay, I, what do I do with this now? And it, it, it's so important to show your work, not just to do it. That's it, that's the interview. <laughs>